Good evening, everyone. I'm Joel Samuels. I'm the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences here at the University of South Carolina. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you, many familiar faces, in fact, uh, to tonight's exciting conversation. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome you to this inaugural conversation on the South, on the American South, to be precise. I'm especially excited by this series because it aligns perfectly with our mission and vision in the College of Arts and Sciences. As I see it, our college, the largest in the university, has a special charge to adopt a public-facing stance, one that disseminates the scholarship we produce to a wide audience. We also have a responsibility to bring together multiple disciplines into a sustained conversation. In many ways, interdisciplinarity is the heart of who we are and what we do. Conversations on the American South, produced by the Institute for Southern Studies, does all of this and more. These conversations are a live podcast interview with distinguished scholars, teachers, and students of the South from a wide range of backgrounds. They are recorded in front of an audience and broadcast on the Institute's highly successful Take on the South podcast series, which if you hadn't had, haven't had a chance to listen to, I would highly commend to you. I'm not a podcast guy. It's one of the two podcasts I've ever listened to, and I've listened to each one. They are made possible by the generosity of the Robert McNair estate. Tonight's event reflects collaboration, and so I want to thank many co-sponsors, including the History Center, the Department of History, the African American Studies Program, the Women's and Gender Studies Program, the Institute for African American Research, and the Humanities Collaborative, all of which share a common nucleus, namely the College of Arts and Sciences. Tonight's conversation will be led by Dr. Mark Smith, a Caroline Distinguished Professor, who I have a long introduction of that I'm going to pass because about half of his colleagues are in the audience. But I want to thank Mark for his leadership, not only uh, as a scholar, but in leading the Institute for Southern Studies and for the work, Mark, that you've undertaken over the past year and a half in uh, creating a vision, developing it, implementing it, and bringing together uh, so many players. Mark regularly reaches out to me, I mean, every few months and says, there's this faculty member looking to come to us from X college, a completely different college, who has this very interesting connection to Southern Studies. Could we think of a way to collaborate with them? He's always thinking in those sort of synapse ways, which, which really, as a, as a partner, um, uh, is really exciting for me. And he's found this role where he's been able to combine his prodigious intellectual heft with his skills as a storyteller, which I know that we'll see tonight in the conversation that will unfold. Fittingly, our inaugural guest conversation is Professor Thavolia Glimpf, who is not only the Peabody Family Distinguished Professor of History at Duke University, but also a professor of law and a faculty research scholar at the Duke Population Research Institute. All of that's at Duke, but she's also, as many of you, but perhaps not all of you may know, a native of Columbia, South Carolina, and a former colleague of ours as a professor in the history department. Her work focuses on slavery, emancipation, plantation societies and economies, Gender and Women's History, and the Era of Reconstruction. She is the author of The Women's Fight, The Civil War's Battle for Home, Freedom, and Nation, which has won a number of prizes, including the Albert J. Beveridge Award, the Joan Kelly Memorial Prize, the J Julia Cherry Spruill Prize, and the 2021 Darlene Clark Hine Award. It is also available for those who haven't, uh, don't have a copy of it. It's available out front, uh, courtesy of the Law School's Barnes & Noble uh, uh, colleagues. Her first book, Out of the House of Bondage, The Transformation of the Plantation Household in 2008, was a co-winner of the 2009 Philip Taft Book Prize and a finalist for the Frederick Douglass Prize. She is cu currently completing a book manuscript on African-American women and children refugees in the Civil War, which received support from an NIH grant. Please welcome me in joining Professor Glimpf back to Columbia, back to the University of South Carolina, She's one of the leading historians on the Civil War. I'm excited for the conversation. I know we all are to hear your thoughts in this conversation with Mark Smith on a take on the New South in America. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dean Samuels. That was a very kind and helpful introduction. Um, before we start our conversation, a few housekeeping matters. Uh, first off, um, I do want to, to say to Dean Samuels, thank you for your support for Southern Studies and for interdisciplinarity generally. It's important and meaningful. Special thanks to my colleague, Pat Sullivan, director of the History Center, Jeff Williams, uh, for his immensely helpful uh, activities, Matt Simmons, my director, assistant director of Southern Studies, um, and also the producer of Take on the South. And most importantly, thank you for being here on what is undoubtedly the coolest day of the year so far. We're happy to have you. 
As Dean Samuel said, um, this is a recorded conversation, so feel free to make as much noise as you'd like. You can clap, you can laugh, just don't groan. All right? <laughs> Your cell phones, probably a good time to turn them off, um, simply because this will be recorded and then it will be replayed on our podcast. We're going to be chatting for about 30, 40 minutes, something like that, and then we're going to open up the floor uh, to questions. Now, because this event is recorded, Please wait until we get a mic in your hand, and Jeff here will be circulating the mic so that we can record your question for the podcast. And if you want to listen to the podcast, it should be up in a couple of weeks on Take on the South, and you'll see above you, my well, timing didn't work out, but you will see uh, something where you can do a QR code on it, um, perhaps from a distance, so you can subscribe to it and adore the podcast from that perspective. All that said, I would like to welcome our special guest for our inaugural Conversations on the American South, and it is my distinct honor to introduce my teacher, my colleague, and my friend, Professor Thavolia Klimp. Thavolia, thank you for being here. Naturally, I want to discuss your work in some detail. This is pioneering work on the Civil War. But first, tell us a bit about your background. Joel mentioned that you're a Colombian native, um, born here, raised here. Where did you go to high school? Goodness. <laughs> first of all, um, let me say this is a little awkward because you all are sort of behind me here and I'm trying to talk to him in a conversation. So um, if I kind of, yeah. Um, Thank you for shifting a bit over. That really is helpful. Uh, so, yes, um, I grew up in Colombia, um, and um, I had, um, you know, which is really looking back on it, and growing up in Colombia and spending the summers with my grandparents um, uh, in a, a small town called Carlisle. South Carolina, um, really transformative, um, formative in terms of how I think and about the South uh, and about history. And um, and I should say, you know, thank you um, for the really wonderful introduction. Um, and I may not get to say it again. I may forget to say it, but I also want to say that being a member of the history department at this institution was also so important to the person, to the historian that I became. I was looking at the website before I came and uh, most of the people who were here when I was here are no longer here, but um, I see one person uh, who was here um, and um, it was really um, wonderful being at this institution. Um, so I didn't say much about growing up in Colombia, but I think we'll get to hopefully talk about that more as we go on. So your early kind of introduction to history occurred where? Uh, was it at high school or was it you went to Hampton? Um, where, where was your principal exposure to the study of history? It was really in Colombia in the colored library. Um, I was really fortunate um, to be able to spend my summer time when I was not at my grandparents um, in the colored library in Columbia. And I was always uh, a reader. And my father had actually built a little, um, people call them doll houses, but it was a little house um, for my sister and myself. And on her side, there were dolls. <laughs> and on my side, there were bookshelves. And um, when I went to the library, I just read. Um, and I read only history books. There weren't many history books um, about black people. And so I read history books about Europe and kings and kingdoms and colonies. And when I went to college, I thought I was going to major in European history. Uh, so. Um, I think that when we talk about memory and monuments, and I think about the colored library, and there were sections, and there was a section on history, but it didn't have much about black history. Um, but we did get to 
explore black history in, in public schools here and um, yearly trips to Fort Sumter. And what I remember about those trips most is that we were going to get a, a kind of narrative when we got to the fort. But on the bus on the way, we got a history of the fort and of the 54th Massachusetts. You know, So there was always a kind of education going on in my life that pretty much led me to this point. So let me get this right. You started off in European history. I did too, oddly enough, <laughs> shockingly. And then you found your way to American history and Southern history. Can you share with us how, I mean, for me, it was a very straightforward, but it, you have, it's, it depends on who you read very much, doesn't it? I mean, and some historians ignite your imagination about a particular topic. Who was it that you read that ignited your imagination about Southern history? It was Harold Whitman. Um, as an undergraduate at Hampton um, Institute, now Hampton University, I had an extraordinary history professor who had us in the archives um, at Hampton and who had us reading the, the history from UB Phillips to the present to John Franklin and on and up. But she had us really working in the archives. And among the secondary sources that she had us read was an article called The Profitability of Slavery, uh, written by Harold Whitman. And I thought it was the most brilliant piece of scholarship I had ever read. I, um, I kept reading it over and over again, and I decided I wanted to work with him. Well, he had no knowledge of this, of course. Um, this was in the days when I, you know, one did not write and, and, and ask, at least I didn't, I didn't know that that was a thing. Um, and so I applied and I got in and I wouldn't even look at anything else because I wanted to work with him. And I feel very fortunate that I was able to work with Whitman, um, who, and it's, it's, and I'd had a conversation, he died last year, and I had a conversation with him on his 93rd birthday, and, and, and he said, you really, you know, at first he thought I was moving away from the field, and he said, you really didn't, you just took it in a different direction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so um, I think that all of us have one or two or five people in the field who we read and we go, oh my God, you know, um, that's what I want to do. That's how I want to think. That's the kind of scholarship that I, thank you. That's the kind of scholarship that I want to be invested in. And so, um, yeah, that's how I got from European to US. Uh, what was he like though earlier as a teacher? He was the kind of professor who kept a kind of distance, except when it came to your work. Um, he was, I not only grew up loving history, but I grew up loving the English language. And I have to acknowledge um, someone in the audience um, who um, probably doesn't want to be acknowledged, but who I feel a particular kinship with when it comes to this love of, of the language, and that's Nikki Finney. Um, where are you, Nikki? Uh, uh, we call, uh, the, uh, sisterhood of the pencil. Um, so I grew up loving um, just words, and Woodman was also a lover of words, um, where every word counts. Um, so you just don't write a sentence or a paragraph um, without thinking about the, the placement of every word. And of course, some of that you learn as a, at least I did as a child in the public school system in Columbia, where back then, you know, you had to diagram sentences and so forth. Um, so he was a great mentor. Uh, he took me to my first conferences. Um, he, back in those days, you know, people drove, and so he would drive everywhere. Um, particularly to the meetings of the Southern Historical Association. Um, and so he, he was just a great teacher. Um, people today you know, have a great professor. He was a great teacher. Um, 
in addition to being a great scholar. And so I learned from him a lot about thinking historically and, and also about what it means to be a, a good mentor to others. I, I can speak on sort of first-hand knowledge here. Favolia and I met 33 years ago. Oh, goodness. It's quite scary. I arrived in 1989 at the University of South Carolina. The next month, Hugo hit, and then I met Professor Glimpf. And she directed my master's thesis. And I was looking back through old correspondence between us, and the comments were brutal. Just brutal. But I needed it. And uh, I think you said to me once, Mark, you need to understand that each word is a dollar, and you're very, very poor right that way. And it stayed with me. That degree of precision is a very valuable lesson. And I do wonder, that came from Howard Woodman, obviously, but your earliest books were collaborative books, weren't they? And they were with the Freedmen's Project, um, which documented the coming of freedom during the Civil War and during Reconstruction. Personally, I think that that project um, was absolutely essential to a whole generation of Civil War scholars and it probably hasn't give, been given its, its due recognition for providing that foundation. Could you say something about how you got into the Freedmen's Project and what it meant to you? Well, first of all, I think you're absolutely correct that the Freedmen and Southern Society Project has been essential to the work of countless scholars today. I mean, I find some books today that are written using just the documents mm -hmm. from the project. Mm -hmm. um, but before I got involved with the project, I had started working um, in the archive and um, at the National Archives. And Harold Whitman um, introduced me to Ara Berlin. And Ara was working at that time in the, in the stacks on this project. And he invited me to come and, and be an editor on the project. And I, I did that, um, and it was, quite an experience. Everything that I, I think I know now about collaborative work, I learned from the project. Um, we would, you know, you, you think about like, what is the day like for a historian? And we work so much in isolation today. Um, with that project, we gather, we had our little spaces, we didn't have separate offices, um, and we work on whatever part of the project we were working on that particular day. And at any moment, someone would stop and say, gather, everyone would gather, because he or she or they would read a document and go, oh my goodness, I've never seen anything like this before. And then we'd stop and that person would read that document. Um, we'd write five pages and circulate it to each other. So it was the, we were co-editors, but also co-authors. Not a chapter um, in those volumes that I worked on came out without every person touching it. Um, and at lunch, we didn't, I, you know, we never went out to lunch. We brought our lunch, and at lunch we sit and talk about what we were doing. Uh, and we never got tired or bored. Uh, so it was uh, really wonderful. The, the documents are still, you know, when I teach and sometimes when I give talks, they're so powerful that you, you can't forget them. You know, probably many people here know Spots with Rice. Anyone know Spots with Rice? A black soldier who writes to the person who owns his wife and children from a hospital bed and he tells his children that he's coming and the woman who claims to own them, that he's coming to get them, and, and how he used to believe that this woman was a Christian, and he no longer does. But there's this one part where he says, I now have the power of the Union Army behind me, and we're coming to Glasgow, and I will get my children. Um, and, you know, these kinds of documents you, you read and you don't forget, you know, the woman and... Uh, Marilyn, who wrote to Lincoln and said, um, Dear Mr. President, I want to go visit my people on the Eastern Shore. Can you tell me, you know, am I free to do that? Um, and I think um, I know that the field of Southern history and African-American history and Civil War history has become 
much richer because that project introduced historians not only to bureau records, like the pre-bureau records, but also to the fact that the records about black people existed in the Treasury Department records, in the State Department records, um, in the War Department records, where people had not looked for them before. So it's a real forensic analysis of, you know, where do you find this history? Exactly. Yeah, and it's scattered along all, all sorts of departments and bureaus. And it was the job of the Freedmen's Project to collect and gather those documents and to present them in some kind of narrative that made sense, right? Yeah, when you think about the fact that, the, you know, the, the, the project editors um, read millions mm. of documents and, and brought, you know, several... 100,000 back to the Maryland copies of them. Um, it, it's the forensic part is first of all going through those millions and then um, pulling out documents to take back. And, and you think, well, what's left that you know didn't get brought back? And yeah. I think that one of the tragedies is that people aren't going back to the library or to the archives to see what the project didn't get which has to include so many gyms, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, I, you know, looking back at those names on those early sort of volumes as you, as Barbara Fields, Steve Hahn, I mean, these are significant historians, probably the, the leading historians of the subject in the nation. And I do think there was a kind of real teaching in that process that led to that deep analysis and knowledge of the African-American experience during the Civil War, the thing that had been missing largely from conventional narratives. Um, and I think I remember you, you know, giving me this, one of these volumes and saying, read that and your life will be improved. So you went to Penn State and then you ended up at Duke where you've been for, a, what, two decades now, is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's shift our gears to looking at these, these two very important works, Out of the House of Bondage, which is 2008, and The Women's Fight, uh, 2020. There are many ways to evaluate the Civil War. Um, it's transformational, we know this. Many books on the topic kind of just dish out the metrics, don't they? You know, 750,000 deaths, 3.8 million people freed, constitutional crises, political revolution, economic dislocation. All of that is true. All of that is recognized in your work. But you're trying to introduce additional ways to understanding the significance of this war. What would you say is you, you know, your addition to that narrative? Well, it's really, that's an uh, interesting and great question. Maybe I'll sort of rephrase it in a way. My thinking um, in writing both books was to think about um, you know, you, you survey the field, and there is so much written about the Civil War, for example. And you think, you know, my goodness, you know, what more can we say mm -hmm. about it? Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, with the first book, for example, on women, you know, what more can you say? And I thought, well, what I was reading um, was not what I saw in the archive. So there had to be more to say, because in the archive, I read white women, their letters and their diaries, um, household accounts and so forth, where they were speaking of the violence that they meted out to black women um, in their households. And when I read the um, WPA narratives, black women were speaking about the violence in the household. But when I read the literature, it was about a sisterhood among women because of gender. And it, so it didn't fit. Um, so it was clear that I could say something, but um, trying to say it in a way that um, made clear the power dynamics and made clear the centrality of the home um, as a space of work, um, not just um, a sociability. So, and knowing that so many of the scholars who had written about this were fine scholars, um, so it wasn't. I didn't want it to be an attack on those who had written about, but I wanted to advance the field. 
And so that was that book. And when I looked at the Civil War, it again, there was so much that didn't, um, so much there, but also so much that seemed to me to not be there. And what was not there, it seemed to me, that people don't live in vacuums. Northern women who came to the South didn't just live with themselves, but they lived in conversation with black women um, and with black soldiers. Um, elite white women lived in conversation with black women and with poor white women. So I, I'm thinking about the way in which people live. And so I wanted to write a book that would convey struggles and fights and battles and um, alliances as well in, in just the way in which they happened. And I didn't know if I could do it, um, but the archives made it easy to do that. And so when people, um, and I tell my students this all the time, there is a uh, increasing attention to this idea called the silence in the archive. Well, my archive is not silent. My archive, the archive that I use for my work is boisterous, it's noisy, it's filled with the voices of black people, of poor white people, and I wanted to write um, a book that in which they, I didn't, you know, give voice to them, but in which their voices were present. Um, I, I, we can't give voice, but we can um, present the voices that are in the archive. And the voices that you've identified, that you've recovered, um, that does require that same kind of forensic attention that you were exposed to early in your career. I can't help but think there's a connection there. I mean, it strikes me that what you did with the, the Friedman documentary stuff, it, it feeds directly into your, your work, and it, you're not finding the silences because you're a better listener because of it. Well, I think... The Friedman's project and my um, my experience as a student of Whitman's and my experience growing up in the South. Growing up here teaches you to be aware of and hear multiple voices and those voices don't disappear when you become a historian, right? You're still aware of the fact that people speak in many ways, and they speak to each other in many ways. Um, and so I think, I think, you know, sometimes people have said, you know, when they know, if I know I'm from the South, you know, like, oh, you feel sorry for me. But no, don't feel sorry for me. Um, I, um, I'm a proud member of this community. I'm a proud South Carolinian. This is where my people, um, lived and died and and worked to ensure that I could be here and that I could do the work that I, this descendant of an enslaved people, that I could go to the archive at the Caroliniana or to the state archives and that I could bring those stories um, to the present. Um, the story said when slaveholders wrote letters to each other, um, and in those letters when they talked about enslaved people, they were not thinking that I would come along to read their letters and to see in those letters um, possibilities for thinking about how enslaved people lived, even though the enslaved people were not themselves speaking. So I'm, I never want to lose sight of the fact that I am the historian I am in part because of having grown up in this particular world um, and, in, and lived a part of my life in a world where um, there was still segregation. Um, um, I can remember going to the side door for the theater and I can remember going to the downtown and having to um, eat at a separate counter. Um, and I, I don't ever want to forget that, but, but what that also reminds me is that the people that I grew up with, um, 
didn't live their lives in a vacuum either. And so I don't want to write in a vacuum. I don't want to imagine people living in a vacuum. I don't know if that makes sense. It, it, it actually makes perfect sense. What, one of the, the great pleasures of working in the history department is that once in a while I get to teach our graduate course on um, 1787 to 1877. It's his, historiographical. And this semester I assigned Out of the House of Bondage to be reviewed by one of our graduate students. I was especially pleased with this review because she put her finger on just that. She made the point that you do not engage in compare and contrast. You engage in the excavation mm. of kind of real-time conversations and dialogues. And it's that frism, that dialectic of those conversations that constitute the essence of their experience, not the artificiality of here are white mm. women and here are black women. You are looking at them as organic holes and that hole has to be based on that conversation but it's a very difficult conversation to recreate isn't it Thavoli because it requires a certain not just attention to detail but almost a reimagining of the space that they occupied you you say in that book that home was a political figure and space that the home itself had that presence as a political figure and it's in that context that you're you're listening to those conversations is that right um, that's a very um, quite exquisite um, uh, comment about my work. Um, so tell the student I appreciate it. I think um, that she, the student, is is right in that I'm not interested in comparing black women to white women or, or poor women to rich women. I'm interested in thinking about them as human beings, as people who inhabit spaces and in those spaces they interact and at the same time thinking about what's at the center of those spaces and for me it's the figure of the home it's what um, white men north and south are told they fight for and that home is a political space it has to be because of slavery and and many other things and so the investment in that political space means that Certain people should not have access to that particular notion of home, right? And so I want I wanted to think continue to think about this notion of home that I wrote about in, in Out of the House of Bondage in the Civil War book, because it's so central. When Southerners went to fight for home, they fought for home for white people and to ensure that black people would never have a home. And black people fought for home. And a lot of scholars talk about the reconstitution of the black family after the war. Um, and But what sort of sometimes gets missing in that conversation is that that reconstitution of the family is about the making of a free home. Um, and so when some of the people that I write about in this book, the last book, they're, the white women are trying to build new homes, but they still want to build them on the backs of black people. And black women are saying, no, we want to build a different kind of home. And that has to be a free home. And it, and it doesn't have to look like the free homes of white people. A free home for black families after the war might be a home in which there were four widows whose husbands had been killed during the war. It might be a home in which the head of the household, and this is what I'm finding with the refugee project, might be uh, a young man who had been orphaned during the war, but who now has in his home three other Orphans, they're younger orphans, and but that's a, a kind of constitution, a reconstitution that takes place during the war. So I think home is political, and we don't think about it enough as a political space. I, I think that's one of the, the great insights of that book, and it certainly helped me think about what it means. Your 2020 book, The Women's Fight, The Civil War's Battles for Home Freedom and Nation, won all sorts of awards. Um, I was just delighted to see it, and well done. Well, one of which you had already won. I, well, <laughs> so, some, sometimes award committees just become extraordinarily generous. I think generous. We're, we're, we're both winners of the Caribbean Prize. <laughs> it's no longer called the Caribbean Prize. But they don't call yeah, it that any longer, yeah, do they? Yeah. Um, but it's, it's, it's nice to share that platform with you. Um, 
This is a really capacious book. I mean, you're talking about so many different constituencies in that book, um, and nobody had really done this before, um, not in this way. Uh, I'm not going to ask you the aerial question, what's the book about? Um, Because I think we'd be here for quite a while. Um, But fundamentally, and I'm just going to venture this and tell me how right or wrong you think I am. Fundamentally, it seems to me that a lot of your work, um, the most recent book, Out of the House of Bondage, has to do at some level with competing definitions of freedom and what freedom meant to different constituencies in the context of the Civil War. There is, of course, a kind of poetry to that where we come back to your initial work and the document, documentary project on freedom. But it, am, I, am I misreading your m- most recent book in particular about the centrality of freedom and how it's contested and how it's, it's quite violently contested, right? No, I don't think you're misreading it at all. And I don't think... I certainly have not myself, and I don't think any of us as historians have yet quite got our, um, a, a good handle on this whole question of freedom and what it meant. And so my effort in, in, along these lines in, in this um, most recent book was to show the, the ways in which it was still contested. That For example, that poor white people even um, had a notion of freedom that was different from rich white people and that certain rich white people, um, the slaveholding class, among them were people who didn't even think that poor white people belonged to the same race as they did. And so it's interesting to, um, in the book, and I have examples of where um, the planter class women say, oh, these poor white women belong to a different race entirely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so what does freedom mean for rich white women in that context and for poor women? Um, and rich white women who come south to be teachers and missionaries and so forth, they come with even a different definition of what freedom is. It's not the definition that black people have. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a much more restrictive definition than they carry for themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think we're still working through, and we don't have to, I, 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 I firmly believe this, we don't have to come to a place where we say the meaning of freedom is. We have to come to a place where we acknowledge that freedom encompasses certain basic things, right? But it could also encompass something for me that you might not consider freedom. And it might be my job to help you understand that that's a component of freedom. We could argue back and forth. And I think what people were doing at this moment is arguing back and forth, having a debate about the meaning of freedom. And when they come out of it at the end of the war, it's inconclusive. And so they're still fighting. We're still fighting today, um, certainly, about what freedom means. And um, I just didn't want um, my book to, um, to ignore that question, nor did I want it to pretend that there was a definitive answer to the question. I think that does really important intellectual work and political work at a certain level. It's very important, for example, that in American culture, the idea of freedom is broadly accepted, uh, standard, and stable. And what your research is saying is it's a much more complex, multivalent, con- contested definition. Yeah, and it, so I think it's, a, it's mythical, right, yeah. that it's stable. That's it's right. never right. been stable. Right. Um, it was not even stable with the among the men who, you know, um, wrote the, the Constitution, they weren't all on, you know, on board with every idea about what freedom meant. And we can see that in, in some of the, you know, problems that we have with what various things in the Constitution meant to them and what they mean to us. So um, recognizing that it was never stable, I think, is really important. I think too. it's absolutely yeah. important. Yeah. And that, that's, that's the, my take, kind of takeaway from that important book. I, I just, that's my, my number one summary mm. of it, and it makes perfect sense. So what, what, what's next for you? What, what's, what's your next <laughs> project? Well, I have this book <laughs> that I've been working on for 20 years mm-hmm. um, on refugees, um, which is getting bigger and bigger, but, but hopefully coming to an end. Um, and... Um, and two other 
projects. I've been working for quite some time on a book on um, the uh, Confederates in Egypt. Um, the men who had been officers in the Confederate Army and some in the Union Army who joined the Egyptian Army in the 1870s and 80s. Um, and um, it's called Playing um, Dixie in Egypt. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, the archive is so huge for that project. And my, before I, I quit, <laughs> I, I, I want to, as I've been telling people recently, I, I want to write a book about um, uh, the upcountry South Carolina and uh, the plantation economy in the upcountry, which I think is still a fairly neglected. And, and it brings me back home, uh, in a sense, so. Brings you back home, doesn't it? Yes. Um, I would like to open up the floor now. Okay. Um, we have a lot of people here this evening, and um, I suspect that people have questions about your work, your background, where it's headed, what you've done already. And if you do have a question, put your hand up, and Jeff will, Jeff will get the, the microphone to you. Hello, everyone. Bavolia, welcome home. Thank you. I have 10 questions. <laughs> <laughs> My first one has to do with um, Carlisle, South Carolina. I have this theory and I have this understanding, personal understanding, that the person that I became, the poet that I became, the woman that I became, had everything to do with the summers that I spent in Newberry, South Carolina and my grandparents' farm. Um, one of the reasons that I love your work so much is because I will answer the question, what you have given to Southern history, which is that portraits, nuance, a slowness to seeing the humankind in that person. And so I'm wondering, have you thought about and now I'm gonna, because I didn't even know it was Carlisle, I'm, we're gonna be in conversation about that for the next 20 years, but the way we could meander in the out of doors, the way we could see certain kinds of things um, sitting out in the pasture or grass, or I, I'm, I have an understanding about that personally, and I'm wondering, have you thought about how that has made your writing, your love of language, your love of, of capturing the person it slowed you down and has kept you making sure you get that right. And I just wonder if you could talk about a little bit about perhaps the collaboration of the out of doors with your brilliance and your intellectual um, acuity uh, happening at the same time. Uh, thank you, Nikki. That's such a, a great question. And um, I don't write about any place that I have not been to. I have to walk the ground. Um, and you're right, I'm, I'm a slow writer. Um, but it, and I think that I hadn't thought about the way you put it in terms of the outdoors, but certainly spending the summers with my grandparents, it was a time when I could take a book or uh, a catalog from Sears and sit on the porch and read um, with no distractions except for the sounds of nature. Uh, it's a time when I, you know, and now as a historian, I appreciate knowing that when cotton comes up, it's not white, but pink or red knowing what it means to put a watermelon in the creek to let it chill, or to you know, have fresh vegetables from the garden on the table for dinner every day. So I think there is something in that. I think that's what I was trying to get to in, the, in one response to Mark. It's like growing up here, it's been just essential to who I am 
as a scholar um, and more precisely as a historian. Um, and it's that walking too. It's like my grandparents lived on a, their house was on a hill and it's walking down the hill to the main road to get the mailbox and walking into the nearest town. Um, you know, I have this memory in my head with my grandfather um, or going to Union on, uh, you, know, you know, once a month to get supplies. And when I, um, after my grandmother, my grandparents died, I, you know, was going through some of their papers and um, I found that every year she had um, a white attorney in Union do her taxes. He typed up her tax reports and so it's a record of how many bales of cotton she made, how much she paid for fertilizer, um, how much she paid for labor. And so it's like juxtaposing that knowledge with my walking those fields and walking um, the peach orchards and gathering blackberries from the bushes along the road, and which has inspired me in my um, later years now to want to go back. I still own the house that she last lived in um, when they gave up farming. They bought a house in town in Carlisle. And I you know, used to dream of turning it into a writer's retreat, maybe one day. But I think that's really probably more important than any other education I had. Um, those summers spent with them and yeah, and even the even the religion, you know, even the revivals and the preparing the meals um, and spending a week in church, <laughs> um, all of that. Thank you. You read most of your documents that were in in, in handwritten documents. Some uh, archives, the Massachusetts Historical Society, has typed some of these old letters, which is very, very nice, makes my life easier. What were the challenges of looking at some of these old documents in terms of the, finding out what the script really said or determining it, and what, what, how you had to cope with faded manuscripts? Well, I think, you know, as you, as you know, after a while, you know, it becomes really um, easy to read 19th century manuscripts because the, you, you grow accustomed to the um, handwriting um, I think it may be harder for students today who just don't, have never really written, you know, uh, in cursive. Um, um, and now, you know, sometimes now my students are like, oh no, especially the undergraduates, you need know, to send them to the archive, and like, I can't read it. So I will go and sit in the archive with them. And it doesn't take them long to say, oh, that's not, you know, it's just like, for them, it's like a foreign language and um and they don't know what do means or what you know a slant this way means but as a historian you know the more you work and the more it becomes so now it's really easy it's also uh, because of this long experience so you know i used to be really frustrated civil war documents were because of the scarcity of paper you know they write this way, and then they turn the paper and write across it, and some would get dis desperate and write diagonally. Um, and at first, those were really <laughs> frustrating, but now I can read them pretty easily. So I think it's just this long engagement with them. I think, yeah, uh, uh, definitely a challenge, um, and students have to, I think, as I said, more of a challenge for them because they're not used to cursive writing, period. It's good to see you again, by the way. Um, for coming to us and um, treating us to this, these reflections on history and memory. I wanted to ask you a question about the relationship between them and bring you to the part where you were saying that one of the ways you became a historian was when you were learning to listen in Columbia. And I guess I, I wanted to ask if you could um, tell us a little bit about what you heard about the history of Colombia and especially the African-American history of Colombia. I'm especially curious to hear whether you heard much about 
Reconstruction Columbia and whether you had a sense that it was the town that once had a black majority city council and was the capital of a state with yes. substantial African-American political power and, and policies that followed from that, um, including the integration of the university. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the sort of history you learned orally when you were young? Well, the, the history that you just noted first of all, like the reconstruction governments and the, so forth and black majority, I learned in school in the public schools. Um, you know, in terms of what was, you know, the history around me that I heard around me of what we would now consider history. Growing up, you know, it was, looking back, it's like we lived it. And so if you, if you had to, if your mother had to draw your um, foot on a piece of paper to go buy your shoes, that came with a question, why? Which came with an answer, because you could not try on shoes in the store. These moments of learning um, come to make up a story. So it's not like somebody sits you down and says, this is what segregation looks like, or this is what racism looks like, or this is what, um, colonialism or you it's taught to you in increments at least that was my experience that it came to me in increments and so as a person growing up by a certain point in your life you have developed a set of skills based on knowledge that your parents deem you can handle at that point and that continues to I think operate um, and I think it doesn't um, you know, we still have a little bit of that. You know, when my son was young, I would not let him um, go to the mall without a lot of instruction about how to conduct himself. Um, and so that for him, if someone were to ask him, you know, 40 years from now, what was it like? You know, I mean, he might point to those kinds of things. Um, so, you know, I, I, I don't know if that, you know, it really answers your question, but it, it's a process of learning um, the factual things like um, the black majority and the reconstruction government. And, and I mean, you got that at school, but the things that got it you through daily life, you learned at home. Uh, and yeah. And I was telling Mark earlier that I, um, I've been really frustrated by the, some of the conversations around the monuments because I grew up here around monuments. And um, some of that conversation posits that um, um, black people, you know, the monuments induce fear. Um, and I don't know of anyone for whom that was true. I do remember anger. Um, and, you know, but not, you, you see a monument, you go, you don't go, oh, I feel inferior. You, you go, that really ticks me off. And that was the way I was brought up. And so I don't understand much of the conversation today. Thank you for sharing with us today um, so much of your story. Uh, resonates with me, though there's a generation between us. Um, my question stems from your first book, Out of the House of Bondage. Um, that was the first time that I had read um, a story where black women had agency and they were part of um, the Civil War. I'd studied it in undergrad, but in graduate school, I got to see myself in that period in a different way. And one of the things that you do beautifully is you share narrative um, and that invites lay readers into what we do as historians. And so my question is, what role do you see narrative, um, the art and the craft of narrative um, playing in inviting folks into uh, various controversial conversations about the history of race and power and the law in this country? Thank you, I, I think it's essential um, and 
I had the uh, wonderful opportunity to, this morning to go to the Anne Frank Center and um, the director, I'm blanking on the name. Doral Stebbin. Doral Stebbin, yeah. His, the way in which he takes you through that space is extraordinary. It's, he tells a narrative in such a way that you you get it, you're, you're frustrated and maybe even angry about what happened to um, Jewish people, but it's, it's, it's done in a way that invites you to, to do something constructive, right? To think about um, how you can be a part of change as opposed to being a part of, like, I'm so mad, I just want to destroy. And I always um, have, as I became a, a historian, have always wanted to be that kind of writer who can talk about awful things but invite people to have a conversation. And it's really hard, especially when you're talking about violence, because at what point does it become too much? At what point, you know, do you tell 50 stories of somebody getting beaten or 100 stories that can you do with five? Um, and so you have to be very deliberative, very careful about how you want this narrative to go and who you want to invite in. And if you want to invite everybody in, there can be no, like, villains, villains. I am always reminded of... Um, a, a very short um, piece that the historian Barbara Fields published in um, the Washington Post. They had asked her to to write something for high school students about why you want to be a historian. And so the title of the piece is "Why You You Know You Want to Be a Historian." And in it, she said, and I often um, have my students read this piece, that if you want to be a historian. You cannot hate people so much that you cannot write about them in the way in which they saw themselves. And I'm paraphrasing here. But in effect, that I have to respect what, I don't have to like a slaveholder, but I have to give him, her, them the space to say who they were. And, and, and that is what I want to put in my book, you say. I don't want to say who you were. I want you to say who you were. And I don't want to, you know, let the fact that I think what you did was horrendous, like color or change the narrative that is supposed to be on the page, right? So, um, and it gets back again to wanting always to be a careful thinker and a careful writer. And we're all in a hurry. And um, I think, um, you know, sometimes we're training graduate students today to be in a hurry. Um, and there's no market for being in a hurry. But, um, yeah, and so we don't give them the space to be, to reflect on what they're writing, except that you have some space once you get the dissertation going, uh, you know, until you get tenure. But, yeah. So thank you for the question. I was actually interested with um, your book that you're um, about to put out about refugees. Um, so I'm actually a student volunteer at the Anne Frank Center um, and have done oral histories with modern day refugees. So I was just thinking about, it's such a new legal term in terms of like we think of refugees as a, a modern conception, but that's not really true and I like the idea of using the word refugee to talk about historical populations that have had to flee because they like they existed before the United Nations created a term for it. Um, so I guess I just wanted to ask what kinds of stories you're finding in that book and how you're thinking about what the idea of having to leave um, where you are and finding a new place means. Uh, thank you, that's uh, another excellent question. I. Certainly, most people still think of refugees as something that happened in the people who, you know, 
who gained the status in the 20th century, in large part because of the UN um, protocols um, that came out after World War II about refugees. Um, but the term was, of course, used um, even before the Civil War. And I'm interested in a lot of things. And I'll just, because I could stay and talk forever, um, but I'll just uh, maybe mention one that I think is really important. Refugee camps in the Civil War, and there were hundreds of them, were not just spaces into which um, refugees were placed, but they were carefully managed, um, surveilled spaces. And so I'm interested not only in the people who were in those camps, um, and I have a lot of data because of the um, work with some demographers at Duke, and I got an NIH grant to do some demographic work. So I have a lot of data on who was in the camps and ages, you know, whether it was an orphan, whether it was a person who was disabled or um, a widow, whatever. And so I, I'm, you know, I'm interested in those people, the, the women who came in um, and ended up in the refugee camp hospitals, um, and, and then they appear in the records as um, women who have had abortions. I want their stories. But I'm also interested in the camp, the men who run the camps. Um, there's a, a really good book about the German camps called Ordinary Men, and it, which has really been helpful to me to think about the men who managed the Civil War camps. These were the same men who would go on to run the camps of, for Native Americans in the West. And because it's a, a federal institution, the camp, the records are just wonderful. Um, and someone, and I'm working on this part of it now, had the great idea to have um, forms printed up for various purposes. And one of the most used forms is one that said, you know, it had um, columns, printed columns, you know, like the name of the refugee, age, sex, um, color sometimes, where you came from, the name of the plantation you came from and the, and the owner of that plantation, um, age and, and all of this. And so these are, Wonderful federal censuses. Um, then there, there are complementary censuses from the hospitals that have, you know, when people come in, what do they come in for? Um, when do they leave? Do they die in the hospital? And so I'm trying to, like, tell a story based on these records. It's not a story that a sociologist would tell, right? But a story of, uh, uh, where I take from those... Um, from that data, um, individuals who tell the stories of large numbers of people. Um, and I, you know, there have been some really good work done on refugee camps in the last few years. Um, and so I'm trying to do something a little different um, and hoping that now that this other work is done, I can pay full attention to um, this project. Because I'm, I mean, this has been the project of my life and it's still not done. <laughs> the woman with 10 questions. Sorry, <laughs> I'm going to get to just two. But this is a two headed one. You said the colored library is a monument. And I totally agree. And I also know that coming, born, being born in, one of the reasons your work is so holy to me is because I was a I was a black girl who was born in South Carolina who was, you know, there weren't black codes per se, but there were black codes. And one of the black codes was I was not supposed to become an artist. You were not supposed to become a scholar. Um, and so those kinds of, that thing in the air that said, um, you're not supposed to travel across into those kind of um, boundaries, right? But the book, but the colored library, and the, and the barbershop, and the beauty shop, and the, um, the things that were in black communities when they were unfortunately segregated, but also the white gaze was not on black people and black young people, and you had a freedom to like see yourself and see your family and all of that. 
And then you have that in your consciousness, unconsciousness, as you grow up and the world changes and integration happens and you see all of, but you still rest in the part of, of, of that, of your youth that has those black community things, those black monuments. Well, my students tell me they don't have those things. They don't have those things to sort of lean on because urban renewal came, the black community was decimated, um, and, and all of that. And so one of the conversations that I have to have with them is to go and find out what was here, um, who was here, and, and bec become well aware of those names so that you can negotiate all of those avenues that you need to negotiate in this country that didn't invest in you to survive. But you did survive. And, and now what can you do with that? I wanted to, so my question is, I hear you using both those understandings of growing up here, witnessing the black community as an entity that gave you something to hold on to and to abide by black church, those kinds of things. But you stepped out and the world changed and you also now become fluent in what the world right, demands of you, and, and having those kinds of, having all that history, I think, girds you, and it's why, it's why um, both the last two books that you have created have 500 post-it notes by me <laughs> in them, because the references are holy for me, and the people come alive, and the situations come alive, and I'm not sure what the question is that I have, but I think that's what I want to say to you, and this is why your work is so valuable to me and why I always send young people to your work, whether they're historians or not. Well, you know, Nikki, I mean, it's like Rice, um, Nikki's book, Rice, and this is not a love fest, you all, but I have, have to say this. Um, I, when I first read Rice, I hadn't met Nikki, and I, I knew someone at Kentucky, and I wrote this person in the history department at Kentucky and I said, would you get this woman to sign my book? And um, it was like, you know, and I had to buy an extra copy because the books that I really like, I like to mark up and post it. So the, 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 the respect is mutual. Um, it, it's the colored library, by the way, was right down here on Gervais not far from where we are meeting today. Um, and when we talk about, I hadn't put it this way, you just did, but when we talk about monuments and the absence, I think it's the phrase of monuments to um, black life. I think we need to talk about the raising, the destruction of monuments to black life. It's not that we didn't have any. We had some. Um, one was Booker T. Washington High School. Another was the um, elementary school I went to not far from here, Carver, before my parents moved out north. Um, it's, we have a complicated history and we have not done a very good job of telling that complicated history. And so I see a lot of young people here and um, you know, we are depending on you to tell that history. Um, you can do it. Uh, you don't have some of the encumbrances that we had. You might also not have some of the memories that stood as well, but um, I think it can be done, and um, so, thank you. I can't think of a better way to conclude this conversation. That was absolutely enlightening, scintillating, poignant, and probably the best possible way for us to start conversations on the American South. Please join me in thanking Professor Thavolia Glimp. Could, I'm sorry, I have to, uh, uh, I mean, this is, going to be my concluding remark. Um, I just really want to thank Mark for inviting me here. Um, such an honor a, and a double honor to be invited by a former student um, who has excelled.
uh, beyond measure um, and who I hope this institution is proud of. Uh, there are books outside, um, and we have the right person to sign them if you're interested, and we have a small reception outside too, so please help yourself and converse and enjoy. Thank you for coming.